Hey, I'm Tad, the associate pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. This is a, a song, really, it's a prayer for you, uh, for all of us, that we strive to be more like Christ daily in anticipation of that day when he will be magnified and glorified throughout eternity. And creation will be restored, and we'll all be singing our native tongue of praise to him. Uh, so we pray that Christ will be magnified in, you, in your suffering, in your wilderness, even in your joy and in, in your weakness. Um, this is Christ be magnified. One, two, three. Were all creation suddenly articulate
Amen. I'm going to ask if you would uh, to open your copy of the Bible and go to Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to finish up Hebrews 6 this morning. My study this week, I came across this particular story about a, uh, a man who was a believer who was on his deathbed dying. He was talking to his pastor and he was struggling with a sense of assurance and peace and joy he just noticed and noted. He looked at his pastor and he said, Pastor, I know God's made a whole lot of promises and, and I'm just not sure I can remember any of God's promises. The pastor looked at him and he said, Let me ask you a question back. Do you think that God will have forgotten any of his promises, even if we do? And that thought just encouraged that man on his deathbed. And he spoke up and he said, no, God hasn't forgotten a promise, even if I can't remember what they are. God knows them. Gave him a measure of peace and solace as he stepped out of his situation of this life and into the next life. Last week in our text, we looked at a challenging text of Scripture. Thank you for your prayers and your patience with me as we walked through that passage. The next several paragraphs of chapter 6 are not near as challenging, they're quite a bit more encouraging. Encouraging because they do exactly that. They draw us back to the promises of God, the hope that we can have in Christ. In fact, they provide for us several encouragements, four encouragements I, I find in the text that help us in our journey as Christ followers. Read with me, if you will, beginning in verse 9. Though we speak in this way, in what way? Well, that's the previous eight verses, the tensions and challenges about you know, what it is that a believer could potentially lose if they walk away from faith in God through Christ. And I, I landed last week on the fact that they could lose potential blessings and assurances and the, the, the sense of God's presence in their lives if they reject that. And I think the next paragraphs make sense of that interpretation. Notice how he phrases things. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises." For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. These, this chapter is both a warning and, a warning and an encouragement. It's a warning to those who may have the temptation to walk away from Christ and go back to previous patterns of living. We saw that in the previous paragraph. It's also an encouragement. And it's encouragement because the writer says, I don't think that you're described by verses 1 through 8. I think you are the ones that tr truly do genuinely continue to put your faith in God. That's one of the transitions there. And the first encouragement that I find here is we can be encouraged because of God's faithfulness working through us. That's a tremendous encouragement. Notice the way he describes this. Beloved, beloved, same word that's used by God of Jesus. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. The writer is letting the church know that they are a dearly loved people of God. That, that's us. That's us as the people. We're dearly loved by God himself, dearly loved by one another, certainly dearly loved, hopefully, by myself and all of our elders and our deacons. But 
You are beloved. God cares about us deeply. Notice what he says. We feel sure of better things. And that's really the book of Hebrews. <laughs> Jesus is greater. And there's none greater than Christ. There's none better than Christ. And the better things are these, that faith in Jesus, the right relationship with Christ, is so much better than old patterns of religiosity. So much better than the Old Testament patterns and prescriptions and ideas and foreshadowing and images. Those were okay for when, they, for when you had them in the past, but they're not nearly what God intends for us today. We have better things, better things through Jesus Christ. Things that what? But belong to salvation. We can be assured of our faith in Christ. Then verse 11, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work, and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints. God knows the service and ministry of those that are his people. In other words, one of the things he's saying here is that a genuine faith in Jesus Christ is lived out by faithfulness and activity and in service and in love. For the name of Christ, every time we sing a song in praise and in acknowledgement of who God is, that is us expressing our love and respect and honor and majesty for the name of God through Jesus Christ. Every time we minister to someone in love, we show the same thing. Every time we care for someone, every time we affirm what Scripture teaches, we're expressing this element of obedience and faithfulness to the name of Christ and to his saints. We're showing love. In fact, Jesus said something similar in John 13. They will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And notice exactly how he phrased this in verse, in, in verse 10. The love you have shown for his name, the name of God, in serving the saints. In other words, the implication is the writer knows that these believers have lived out their faith. And not just lived it out by showing up once a week on Sundays, but lived it out by ministering to others in the name of Christ. Uh, I think this encouragement's tailor-made for Wilkesboro Baptist Church. In the last uh, 10 days or so, some of you have visited church members in the hospital. Some of you have made meals and taken it to church members who have recovered from surgery. Some of you have written notes, made phone calls, checked on people. Uh, some of you have <laughs> asked how others are doing. Some of you have prayed for those in the hospital. Some of you have made a meal for somebody. And on and on and on I could go about all the different ways that people in our church, I'm, just, I'm not talking about our pastoral staff. I'm not talking about our deacons. I'm not talking about our elders, though we've been a part of all this. I'm talking about everyday church members, followers of Jesus, members of this church community have served and shown love to people in our church community over and over again. And guess what? God knows that. He's not unjust. He won't forget that. He knows what's going on in the lives of those of us who are his people. Assurance of faith and confidence in God can be affirmed by our loving one another. Can I tell you something? One of the things that I think ought to encourage us, ought to grant us assurance of our faith in Christ and salvation is just this remembrance that you wouldn't love that unlovable person if it wasn't for God loving you and changing you so you do love that unlovable person. That's all of us, folks. All of us are truly, genuinely unlovable based on our sinful nature. But the love of God shown through the church is a tremendous encouragement. God knows. Let me give you a second encouragement found in the text. We can have assurance, assurance, assurance of our faith, assurance of salvation, assurance of God's work. We can have assurance by imitating those with patient faith. Notice what verse... Uh, 11 says, we desire that each one of you show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. You know, full assurance of hope to the end. I mean, how many of us want that? I do. I, I want to be someone who, when I'm on my deathbed, whenever that day comes, I am as confident then as I was on the day of my conversion at 18. I want to have that full assurance. I want to know without a doubt that I'm his and he's mine. I want to be able not just to sing, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, and, and now I belong to him, but hold on to that firmly, you know, not let go of that, not, not ignore that. I, I don't want to be one of those who wavers and waffles in my faith later on. It, how do we experience the full assurance of faith? How, how does that take place in our lives? So he says, "'Show the earnestness to have the full assurance of faith until the end.'" 
so that you may not be sluggish. That is dull of hearing, same word as took place earlier in chapter 5 that we looked at last week. Lazy, spiritually lazy is what it carries with it in this context. A person who ignores loving others, who ignores faith and living that out regularly. And then he says, but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So how are we to do that? We're to earnestly imitate faith and patience. Earnestly. Uh, uh, some of us do some things earnestly, and some of us do some things not quite so earnestly. I'm just going to make a confession to you. There are things, the things that interest me are the things that I do earnestly. Anybody in here, can, can you relate to that? And the things that don't interest you, we kind of do haphazardly if we do them at all. I mean, that, that's life. What, G, what the writer here is telling us is to do certain things earnestly. What are we to do earnestly? We're to hold on to that hope that we have, that assurance that we have by imitating the patient faith of those who have gone before. Illustrate what earnestness can look like. World War II there was a particular ensign, a young Midwesterner named uh, Elgin Staples. He was fighting on uh, an an American warship named the Astoria. And while he was on that warship in a particular battle in the Pacific, one of the guns on the ship exploded, and it threw him into the water. And there was shrapnel in his legs. The only thing that kept him afloat was a particular life belt that they had issued to all the sailors on the ship. And that life belt kept him afloat long enough for another ship to come by and pick him up out of the water, and he was eventually restored to the Astoria. But because of the battle, the Astoria was damaged, and the the, uh, captain of the ship tried to run the ship aground in order to be able to, to get everybody off. Well, that failed, and so the young ensign was thrown into the sea another time, uh, along with 500 uh, other of his shipmates. Again, the only thing that kept him afloat was the life belt that he had been issued as a sailor. And so eventually another ship came along and picked up all 500 of those, or many of the 500 of those that had been uh, left in the water. And, and of course, he was shipped out. He was, uh, he was uh, taken care of in the, in the hospitals there in World War II. And he finally was sent home for a period of time because of the shrapnel on his legs And he went home, and he remembered where that belt was made. It was made at a company uh, entitled the the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company of Akron, Ohio. That was the name on the belt, okay? And so he knew that that belt had kept him alive. Interestingly, he he lived in Akron, Ohio, and his mother worked at the Firestone uh, Rubber Company of Akron, Ohio. And while he was observing his rescue and his salvation from, from staying in the water with, with this belt, he memorized the model number that was on the particular belt that he was wearing. And he went back home and he asked his mother about that. He said, Mom, I know you work at the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company, and, and uh, I, I just want you to know that the belt that I was wearing saved my life. And I wonder what it meant, the number. What did the number mean that was on the, the, the rubber belt that I was wearing? She said, well, it was the company's attempt to make sure that, uh, that every employee was held accountable. And so every employee had a number, and every number represented an employee. And, and the reason we did that is because we wanted to take, the company wanted us to take personal ownership for the quality of the material that we were giving to our troops. And, and he said, uh, well, I remember the number, and he quoted the number straight off. The number happened to be his mother's number. His mother was responsible for the belt that saved her son's life in World War II. She did her job earnestly. Folks, that's the way God wants us to live out our faith as followers of Jesus. Not haphazardly. Not, okay, I'll I'll live out my faith today because it's Sunday and I'll ignore it tomorrow because it's Monday earnestly. Earnestly do what? We're to imitate the faith and notice the way he describes it. The patient faith. Patient faith of those who have gone before. Look at faith and patience. Verse 12. 4, verse 13. When God made a promise to Abraham since he had no one greater by whom to swear he swore by himself saying surely I'll bless you and multiply you. Thus Abraham having patiently waited obtained the promise. 
Every, every Christian knows, every believer knows that we're to have faith. And we need faith to enter into a rela- relationship with Jesus Christ. But do you realize that we're to earnestly imitate patient faith? That quote that is here in Hebrews comes from Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. Jesus, God said to Abraham after that event on the mountain where Abraham took his son Isaac to be sacrificed, God reiterated a promise he had made before, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply you. God made that statement to Abraham, probably as Abraham was about 115 years old. I just want to remind you a little bit about Abraham's life. At 75, 75, his mission as a follower of God really began. God sent him from Ur of the Chaldees to the Promised Land. Not at 35, not at 25, at 75 is when his life started. His ministry life, his following God life. It, it was not until he was 86 that he had his first son, and that, that really wasn't the best uh, way to do that, having a son by Hagar, Ishmael. It, it was not until he was 99 that he observed the, the, the uh, ordinance of circumcision in the Old Testament, the sign of the covenant circumcision. So 24 years after leaving Ur of the Chaldees, he affirmed by covenant, by covenant with God, circumcision. It was not until the next year that he got the son of promise, Isaac, and it wasn't until 15 years later that God tested him mightily by taking, asking him to take Isaac up on the mountain. Forty years of faith. Forty years of patient faith. Forty years of ups and downs. Go back and read Abraham's story. It wasn't a straight line of, of consistent faithfulness and trusting in God. It had it had moments of ups, big ups, glorious ups, and it had some downs, some pretty, pretty low downs, some times where he just really missed it. But what the writer is telling us, and it's in order for us to experience that assurance until the end, we need to hold on and imitate a patient faith. Not just trusting in God for the big things, but trusting in God for everything. Not, not having the expectation that God's going to solve all our stuff today, but realizing that God's process may be a process of changing us over a period of time. I'll be honest with you. I don't struggle with faith near as much as I struggle with patience. Maybe some of you can relate. But what God expects of us is an earnest seeking after him through patient faith. Realizing that God doesn't uh, have a fast food uh, a fast food timeline for your Christian faith. He, he's not trying to get you solved tomorrow, get you fixed, change everything about you. He has a lifetime plan for growing you in holiness and righteousness and faith. And, and in the case of the readers, this would be tremendously important because their temptation was to give up on Christianity after a short period of time living as Christ followers and go back to the past. I just want to tell you, folks, don't give up on God. Hold on. Imitate the patient assurance, the faith that Abraham modeled for us, and do so earnestly. The writer's going to tell us ways that we do that earnestly later on in the, in the book as we apply what he's been teaching us theologically. But we can experience uh, assurance by imitating those with patient faith. Let me give you a third uh, particular encouragement that we find in the text. We can hold fast. We can hold on because of God's promises to us. What kind of promises does God make? Great promises, big promises promises. Verse 16, for people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement. Strong encouragement to what? To hold fast to the hope that is set before us. Why, why does this matter? Well, two unchangeable things. Uh, unchangeable thing number one is that God made a promise. Unchangeable thing number two is that God made an oath about the promise that he made. Uh, that is absolutely 
unnecessary. Uh, because when God says something, it is as good as, as sure as done. God does not have to make an oath. God does not have to affirm a promise with an oath because for God to say something is for it to be factually, absolutely, without question, true. God doesn't have to go behind himself and affirm with an oath. God's never going to make a promise, break a promise. In other words, in, if God ever broke a promise, he would cease to be God. And so we might as well give up on Christianity, but God's never going to break a promise. He is absolutely certain, absolutely he is someone that we can trust wholeheartedly. And yet behind the promise that God had made to Abraham, he swore an oath to Abraham. It's like he was saying to Abraham, Abraham, I just want you to know I've made a promise to you and I'm swearing by myself that I'm making a promise to you and that I'm going to keep that promise to you, that I will bless you, that I will multiply you, that I will fulfill the promises that I made. And, and Christian today, as we look back on that statement and that affirmation and the Christian readers of 2000 years ago, the first readers of the book of Hebrews could do the same thing. They could look back and see the entire history of the Jewish people. Isaac and Jacob and the 12 patriarchs and the time in Egypt and the time out of Egypt and the Exodus and the land that was given to them and the kingdom and the kings. And yes, the times when they disobeyed God and when they were idolatrous and they went into exile, but the times when God brought them back with Ezra and with Nehemiah. What could they see? They could see that God had made a promise to Abraham and God had not broken that promise and God had made an oath to Abraham and God had not broken that oath. God is affirming the truth that we can count on him. We can depend on him. We can rely upon him. And that is what gives us steadfast hope and assurance. And he says that we're to hold fast to this. So we who have fled for refuge... There are times in your life where you're struggling spiritually. There are times in my life where I'm struggling for assurance. And what are we to do? We're to flee for refuge. Where? To the God who makes a promise. And a God who makes an oath behind the promise. Affirming without question that he is going to be truthful and he is going to hold on to what he has said. Notice what he goes on to say. We have this encouragement to what? Hold fast. Not let go. Tighten our grip on the promises of God, on the truths that God has given to us in Scripture. Not let go. Hold fast. Not just hold on lightly. Hold fast. But I don't want you to get this. It's not the strength of our grip that matters. Your grip may, may lessen at some point in your life. It is the certainty of the promise that matters. Sometimes we struggle with assurance Quite simply, because we turn our level of vision inward. We look at ourselves. We look at our situations. We look at our shortcomings. We look at our failings. We look at our lack of. One reason why so many are so troubled by Hebrews 6, 1 through 8, is they wonder, is it possible in their failing, flailing Christianity for them to lose something that is so precious. And I'm going to be honest with you. If we take a look inward, we might answer that question in the positive. But that's not what the writer is telling us to do. He's not telling us to look at the strength of our grip. He's not telling us to look at ourselves. He's telling us to look at the assurance of God's promises. Greg Gilbert, in a wonderful little book entitled Assured, puts it this way. He says, the more trustworthy and faithful you learn God to be, the more you will trust him and the more certain you will be in that trust. What this means in the most practical terms is that you need to take specific action to remove your eyes from yourself and plant them on God. Read books about God, about theology, about who God is and what he has done, and read them for God's own sake to know him and love him and stand in awe of him. As you broaden your vision of God, you will find your love and awe of Him deepening. And as the result, and the result of that will be that you will trust Him more. You cer uh, your certainty that He will move heaven and earth to keep His promises will solidify even more. Make sure that you are a vital contributing member of a local church. Gather with brothers and sisters who are themselves engaged in the fight. Sing hymns of praise to God. Hear His word read and preach. Lift up your voice with them in prayer. What you will find is that fellowship with other believers will remind you of God's promises, 
will spiritually stabilize you and will reinvigorate you. Point is, folks, the best way for us to earnestly imitate faith, patient faith, the best way for us to hold on tightly is to look more closely, more deeply, more regularly at the promises of God. The reason you and I can hold fast is because God has never broken a promise and he never will break a promise. We can hold on to his promises. Let me give you the fourth encouragement. We can be anchored in hope because Jesus is the greater promise. Of all the promises God has made, none is greater than the promise of Jesus. And none is more glorious than the promises that Jesus most certainly fulfilled. Notice how he continues, verse 19. We have this. What's this? This promise of God, this assurance. We have this as a sure and steady anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. A sure and steady anchor of the soul. Nautical imagery. A p- picture there that, that God will hold us firm by the anchor he has placed in the ground, under the sea, holding that ship in a firm place. Anchors are absolutely necessary for ships. Read through the book of Acts and the shipwreck story of Paul. Or better yet, go out and be on an be on a boat in the, in the lake or, or the ocean in particular, you need an anchor. So if you don't have an anchor in certain scenarios, the ship's going to be absolutely destroyed. We have this, this hope, this guarantee of God through Jesus Christ as a sure and steady anchor for our soul. He's grounded our hope. He's assured our hope. How has he assured our hope? Notice a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. Now, last week I mentioned that commentaries were split and divided and are very different, very different interpretations of the first paragraph of chapter 6. Almost every commentator agrees that that phrase, the inner curtain, the hope that enters the inner curtain behind the sanctuary, is the Holy of Holies curtain. The imagery there goes all the way back to the the, uh, first five books of the Bible where the high priest on the Day of Atonement, the only time he could enter behind that curtain to go from the holy place to the Holy of Holies was the Day of Atonement. And that curtain represented the very presence of God. And even when the high priest entered, he had to enter with his bells on. He had to enter with all of the things. In fact, he had a rope tied around his leg in case he was not worthy enough to, to offer sacrifice and he died, they could pull him out. I mean, it it was a very significant curtain. It represented the very presence of God. A place we can't go. I mean, God came down to Abraham and made him promises. And God came down to other people in the Old Testament and made them promises. And God uh, orchestrated and designed the tabernacle and the temple and said, here's how you offer sacrifices. But guess what? You just can't go into the presence of God in the Old Testament. Couldn't happen. But Jesus went behind the curtain. The reason we have access to God today is not because you're good enough and righteous enough, not because you've offered enough sacrifices, not even because you're holding fast, not even because your faith is patiently imitating the faith of Abraham or others. The reason we can enter into the very presence of God is Jesus has already gone there. He went behind that curtain. The book of Matthew tells us that when Jesus died on the cross, that curtain that was in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place was torn from top to bottom. It represents the reality that you and I can enter into the very presence of God. That we can be assured of God's promises to us because Jesus has been our forerunner. Notice the phrase he uses, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner. You know what a forerunner is? Somebody who leads the way. The Greek word is archagos. It's a leader. It's, it's, it's someone who, who has set a pattern. You know what God invites us to do? Follow behind Jesus. See, you and I can enter the very places the people in the Old Testament couldn't enter, not because of any righteousness on our part, but because of what God did through Jesus Christ. You can enter the very presence of God. We can hold on to Jesus. Jesus is the greater promise. He is the fulfillment of all the promises of the Old Testament, the glorious fulfillment of any promise in the New Testament. He is who we should focus on. 
Robert Murray Machane, who put together the devotional uh, pattern that I, I've read for more than 15 years, he said this. He said, for every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. I think many of us struggle with a lack of encouragement, lack of faith, lack of patience, lack of assurance, because our look is in the wrong place. Our gaze is in the wrong place. It's at ourselves. It's at our flaws and our failings. It's at our lack. And the more we look at ourselves and what we miss, the more we're going to be patterned to feel like we're failures. It's not who we should look at, though. That's why when we gather, Dr. Mike, we don't sing songs about us. We sing songs about Jesus. That's why when we read the Bible, we read about Jesus. That's why when we preach the Bible, we preach about Jesus. The greatest thing you can do, Christian, is turn your gaze to Jesus over and over and over again. Because if we don't, we're leaving something significant behind. Came across this story, and I'll close with this. About a, a particular nephew who was, uh, was kind of destitute, living in poverty for a good part of his life. And it, he had an aunt that loved him deeply, and his aunt wrote in her will, she said, I bequeath my Bible and all of my belongings and all that I have to my dear nephew, Stephen Marsh. Everything I give to Stephen. After all her estate was settled, there were a few hundred dollars uh, that came out of that particular settlement, that, that estate settlement, and then a Bible that was bequeathed to him. Unfortunately, it wasn't a whole lot, and Stephen continued to live the next 30 years of his life in poverty. Till one day, he went up into his attic, and opened a trunk, and in that trunk was the Bible that he had not opened 30 years ago when his aunt died. It was a Bible that he actually decided to open up. So he opened that Bible. He found more than $5,000 worth of banknotes stuck in the leaves and the pages of the Bible that he had left sitting there for 30 years of his life because he didn't open the Bible and hold on to the promises of God. Folks, I wonder what assurance, hope, encouragement, peace we're leaving behind when we're not opening God's word and letting him speak his assurance and hope and promise to us. If you're here today and you don't yet know Christ, the promise is if you trust Jesus to be your Savior, he'll wash and forgive you of your sins. And if that you would like to trust Jesus today, there's no greater day than for you to receive the promise of God through Christ. Christian, wherever you stand in your journey of faith, let me commend to you, look to God, look to Christ, look to his promises, and find the assurance, peace, patience, hope, and joy that God alone can provide you. Stand with me if you will. Lord God, we come to you sinners. We come to you acknowledging that we are, oh, we are so tempted and so likely to look to ourselves, to act on our own wishes, desires, longings. And Father, I think in my case and probably in the case of many here, the reason that we lack assurance and encouragement when we do is because our focus is in the wrong place. Forgive us for that. Lord God, what a set of paragraphs in this wonderful book that we've been studying. The promises that you made, the promise to never be unjust, the promise to acknowledge even when we're, we don't appear to be as faithful as we should, but when we are faithful, you know that we've been faithful. You know that we've loved and, and you see that. Lord, the, the glories of the fact that you made a promise and an oath, the things we can hold on to, God, I pray that we as your people would stop looking inward and would start looking toward you. I pray that you would deepen our faith and strengthen our faith. 
of putting our focus on Jesus Christ, our forerunner, our priest, our Messiah, our Lord, our Savior. And Lord God, strengthen us to hold on to the promises you've given us through Christ. We pray this in your name. Amen. We're glad to have you worship with us online today. If you'd like to learn more about following Jesus or you'd like more information about Wilkesboro Baptist Church, visit our website, wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us, info at wilkesborobaptist.org. Again, thank you for worshiping with us.